Good morning, church. Good morning, friends. I'm glad that uh, you're with us tuning in this day as we continue on this journey together in the book of Ephesians. And last week we landed in chapter 6 and beginning at verse 10, we started to talk about the armor of the kingdom. And we talked about, you know, the fact that the more we want to wage uh, against and, you know, uh, uh, work against people and focus more on on people and personalities than the the battle which is in the heavenly realms and the spiritual places uh we're fighting with the wrong armor we're fighting the wrong fight and so we're going to be spending a little bit more time talking about that aspect about the the enemy that is the enemy of the soul and the war that is is waging on so we're going to get into God's word, let's just pray and then we're going to get uh, right into it. So Father, we thank you for this day. As we gather, we gather in your name. We gather as your people and we gather because we want we want to continue to learn and to grow and to be a people that are responding together under the the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And so we give you this time, Lord, we give ourselves to this time. We want to have open hearts open minds for just what it is that you would want to speak into our lives this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So let's focus for uh, our time today on 
aspects of spiritual warfare that kind of come out. And last week I, I said that, you know, in my Bible, it talks about the armor of God as my heading, but uh, I also wrote as my own notes in this particular section of Ephesians 6, biblical foundations of spiritual warfare. And I believe that tr that's true. There's some foundational thinking here about spiritual warfare. And you might um, believe that spiritual warfare is only for, you know, Christians who are kind of into that kind of stuff or for maybe for uh, missionaries that are overseas and they're, you know, they're coming against, uh, um, uh, you know, dark forces of, of evil because they're dealing with people who have never even heard of the name of Jesus in their whole lives and in generation after generation. But it's not true. Like, I wish that we were all living in Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. But, uh, you know, we can't and we aren't. And there is a real devil and there are real spiritual forces at work. And every Christian, every one of us is in a real battle. Uh, it's a life and death struggle. And we have a real enemy, Satan, who is uh, wanting the worst for us. And so you might say, well, that's not really what I'm into. I'm more of a person with a gift of administration and balancing the books, or I might be more like, I just want to be with the children. I just want to teach them. I just want to, uh, I just feel my calling is more in worship ministries and all that. Well, that's fine. And you might be more of the thinking that, well, uh, we've got an agreement, the devil and I. I leave him alone, he leaves me alone. That's actually not true. Um, the war that we are in is a war that we're in, whether we like it or not, whether we even agree or not. Uh, you know, and it's not just for some Christians, it's, it's for all of us. And I spoke about that last week, that it is for all of us. And it is a daily battle. It can be a daily victory that is won for us, but it's it's something that is ongoing. And, you know, the war is on for every one of us as believers in Christ, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're engaged in, in spiritual warfare. Whether you know it or not, the Bible states as much, you know, in this part that that we looked at last week, and we're going to look at it again. Ephesians chapter 6, as Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus, beginning at verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Did you hear that? It's not against flesh and blood. But our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the saints. So there is uh, an encouragement here that's coming from Paul, but there's also actually a warning bell that he's sounding for each of us. Paul is reminding us, the word of God here reminding us that we need to be alert. We need to be ready. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, right? We need to get our armor on, the full armor of God, like we talked about last week. Because, friends, we're in a war. We're in a war, and the attack isn't coming from people. 
It's coming from the unseen places, the, the principalities, the rulers, the powers that are in the unseen places, the spiritual realm. And it's so interesting that he, Paul uses the word, we talked about it last week a little bit, about the struggle. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against these forces. Our struggle, the, the word there is actually of a wrestle, you know, the word wrestle. And so I was thinking about, you know, wrestling. I was thinking about sports. I grew up, you know, playing all kinds of sports, individual sports and team sports. I loved football. I loved basketball. I loved soccer. And, you know, with a lot of those sports, um, there's a play that happens and then you're allowed a bit of a time to breathe uh, or a chance to rest or you're in a, a sport like football and you've got, you know, you're maybe on uh, the defensive side. I was a defensive back. And um, and then you'd have your time of standing your ground, of, of trying to thwart, you know, your opposition from making a play. But then it was the offensive, you know, uh, the, the offense time to shine. And so you'd go off the p field while the offense kind of did their thing. And that's not the way it is when you wrestle. When you wrestle, like, I feel like... Uh, I'm not talking about WWF, WWE wrestling. I'm talking about, you know, the real wrestling, the stuff that you see in the Olympics and stuff. And when I wrestled, you know, you you don't get that break. You have got to be on. You have got to be in top, you know, physical form. You've got to be so disciplined. Um, once, once, you know, the match starts, if you let your guard down, even for, a, you know, a second, your opponent knows that and he's going to pin you to the mat. And that's just the way it is. So in this whole area of the spiritual realm and this war that we're in with the devil, you know, as believers, we can't say, you know, time out. I, I need a breather, devil. Um, he doesn't take weekends off. He's not like, well, I just, if I could just have my... Mondays to myself, thank you very much. He doesn't look at our lives that way. He doesn't take it easy on us when we are going through a tragedy. He doesn't uh, go easy on us when, you know, we've been ripped off by somebody. In fact, that's when he pours the heat on in our lives. He's kind of that original, can I kick him while you're down entity and person. He is totally bent on evil. He has no sense of mercy, no sense of empathy or sympathy, what it means to be in a fair fight. There's no practice, no warm-ups. Satan, our adversary, is fighting a real battle with us each and every day. I'd say, you know, we need to learn, you know, the, the three R's in, that we used to know or learn in in school well there's three r's in the battle that we're in with the devil that i think we need to be reminded of and the first one is just the r word recognize and recognizing that we're in a war is a big part of a christian's victory over satan in the war because knowing the enemy's tactics knowing what the enemy wants to do in our lives is is shining light on the dark places that the devil loves to work, right? The devil takes advantage of a person's ignorance. But when there's light that is exposing the darkness, he can't do what he's planned. The Bible tells us, be alert, he said. You know, that's what Paul says here. Be alert, which means we watch. We, we watch... We watch more about Jesus. We keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Yes, we we keep our eyes on Jesus all times, but we have an eye on the work of Satan as well. And the Bible says, don't be ignorant. But instead, Paul says, stand firm against, he says, the devil's schemes. So we know that the devil has schemes and tactics and plans for us that are not the will of God for our lives. And the enemies that we face, they're not bad vibes, right? They're not negative energies in the universe. They're not the dark side of 
the force, but their personalities that think and talk and listen and observe and plan their strategies. So we watch, we're alert. And if we are, we'll recognize strategies of the enemy in our lives and also what he's doing in society, what, he, what he's doing you know, in, in our locations, what he's doing in our communities. Do you see a pattern in your life maybe of, of hurt? A, a pattern in your life of, of shame, a pattern of, in your life of rejection, and it's gone on, and maybe, maybe it's gone on for years, or maybe in your family, you know, there's this pattern that that you or somebody else and it has of of suicidal thoughts, or maybe it's of of addiction, and it's kind of jumping from one addictive behavior to the next addictive behavior. Does something always seem to happen? you know, to your family or to your church, you know, and, and it's always at odds with each other, right? Look for the enemy's strategies. Look for what he's doing, recognize them, and then go to the second R. And the second R is refuse. Refusing Satan. That's that's part of the defensive battle, okay? When the defense is on the field, that's our defensive posture in this uh, war with the enemy that we're in. Refusing what Satan is, is doing, what refusing his plans, refusing his tactics. And once we, we refuse what he's up to in my life, what he's up to in your life, and we ignore it or we avoid it, we turn away, right? We we turn away and we begin doing what the Lord is, is speaking into our lives, what the Lord is wanting, what his will is for us. We lift up the Lord. We make much of him. So we refuse the hurt, right? We refuse to get angry or when we are hurt, when we are angry, we don't we don't let that be our nest for our home. That, that isn't where we reside. We don't stay in the hurt. We don't stay in the anger. We acknowledge it, and then we let it go by, right? That's warfare. Nothing defeats the devil more and faster than just ignoring what it is that he is trying to stir up within our lives. Amen? Okay, so then... The third R is resist. We resist. We're told to resist the devil, and it says he'll flee. We resist the devil, he will flee. So God won't resist him. We resist him. We need to resist him. We speak. We speak to him, and we say, devil, I cut off this strategy in Jesus' name. You have been... You've been doing this to me for 15 years. I think it's about time that you stop. And I'm commanding you in Jesus' name to stop. It's over. And he might try it again. He might bring it up again, you know, in, in a week. He might bring it up later in that day. He might bring it up six months from now. It doesn't matter. But when he's convinced that you're convinced that you have spiritual authority against him, eventually he moves on to something else or to somebody else, right? So that's one of the, the primary ways we recognize, we refuse, and then we resist. And I would say that that is 90% of the battle right there of how Satan wants to work in our lives. So how do we recognize that there is a spiritual war and that we're part of it, we're in it, but not go into, you know giving Satan so much glory in, in all of this. You know, there's two extremes to, to avoid. I think some people tend, tend to blame everything on God's green earth. Everything that happens, any adversity, they, they blame on the devil or they, you know, have a, have a name for everything that is going on in their lives. It is this, it is that, and it's this spirit and it's that spirit. And I think sometimes they can be impressed with the, the heaviness and the oppression. And that can be an unhealthy preoccupation. 
And then on the other side, I think there's there's others of, of us that we're never ready to admit that anything is of the devil or anything, you know, that the devil is doing in life. We don't want to think about it, right? We don't, so it will, we'll say, let's, we're not giving the, the devil any publicity. We're not giving him any glory. Let's just keep our eyes on the Lord. And there is a truth to that, but there's also an untruth to that because we can't make the enemy uh, non-existent just because we, we refuse to recognize that he's there and he's working in life. So how is it that we stay balanced? I think we don't make the assumption that the devil is around every corner, he's behind every door, that he's in every adversity that comes in life. But we don't refuse to consider it either. So how do we know? Well, we ask God. We just simply ask him. We, we pray, we ask, God, show us. And if there's something that he shows us, well, that's what the Bible calls discernment, growing in discernment. So we be aware of what the devil do, uh, does, but we don't be influenced by his activity. Being aware won't hurt you and I. The Bible refers to, to demons and to Satan all the time, right? But but we don't want to be influenced by him. We don't want to focus our lives on him. We focus on the Lord. We submit to the Lord. We live our lives for the Lord and for his glory. And we study more and learn more about God's goodness and God's greatness than anything of the devil. So so there's a a defensive posturing of our lives, like I said, recognizing and refusing and resisting. And then there's also an offensive. And for more of the defensive stuff, I just want to focus on a few. There's, there's a few key areas that the devil wants to work in our lives. Okay, there's kind of three gateways that he tends to want to work and have influence in in our lives throughout the days, throughout our weeks, throughout our lives. And they're the areas of the mind, of the heart, and of our mouths. So let's just talk about those for a few minutes. Our, our minds, our thought, our hearts, and our mouths. So the devil loves to put thoughts in our minds, make us think that there are thoughts when really they're not. You know, and you can be born again, you can be bound for glory with the Lord, but if you got wrong thoughts, friends, on this earth, our bearing fruit, our bearing much fruit that the Lord wants from our lives, it is greatly diminished and greatly thwarted if our thought life is, is not an area that is given over to the Lord. So we got to wage some war on our thoughts. Thoughts that don't agree with the will of God. They don't agree with and line up with the word of God, the truth of God. So we need to think about, here's, here's just a, a great word of advice. We need to think about our thoughts. We need to think about our thought life, analyze our thoughts. And, you know, just once in a while say to ourselves, hey, hey, Nathan, where'd you get that thought from? Is thought Is that thought... A truth? Or is that thought a lie? Is that thought something that the that God wants for you? Or is that thought something that is taking you away from the things that God wants for you? So where did that come from, right? We need to ask the question. Where did where where did that come from? If it's a if it's a thought of pride, or if it's a, a thought that comes that is a thought of fear. Or maybe it's a thought of unbelief. Maybe it's a thought of, you know, uh, condemnation. Maybe it's a thought of bitterness and unforgiveness. Like those things, the Bible tells us we need to cast those things down. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote this, chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. He, he says that there's a thought and it is not in in obedience with Christ, if it's not lining up with the word of God, if it is not a truth that is coming from him, we need to cast it down. We need to put our thoughts 
place them under the obedience of Jesus Christ. Amen? So that's our minds. The next area is, is our hearts. And what I mean by heart is our, our attitudes and our emotions. And wrong attitudes and wrong emotions are killers in our lives, okay? In Ephesians chapter 4, earlier in this, in this um, letter to the Ephesians, in 427, we learn, as Christians, we give the devil a foothold. We give him an opportunity in our lives if we don't deal with wrong attitudes and wrong emotions. So, arrogance or rebelliousness or having an unforgiving spirit, an unforgiving, you know, part of my life. Or if I'm dealing with, you know, contentious and divisive attitudes and thoughts towards somebody or towards my congregation or towards whatever, right? What that does is it is it, it's opening up an area of my life for the enemy of the soul, the devil, to get an in, to get an avenue, to get a foothold in my life to work. And it's it's not just, you know, it's not just non-Christians that are allowing the devil to work. Christians, we allow the devil to work in our lives when we don't deal with with our wrong attitudes, wrong emotions, and place them under, under the obedience of Christ. So Paul, when he says in, in Ephesians 4.26, he says, don't let the sun go down on our anger. What he's telling us is we've got to deal with wrong attitudes. We've got to deal with wrong emotions on a regular basis, like taking a shower, like brushing our teeth. It's something you got to do. He tells us, that just like changing our clothes, we've got to put off, we've got to take off things that are not representative of our new life in Christ. And we put on the attitudes. We put on the armor of the Lord, uh, the things that he has in mind and are according to his will for our lives. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence. Friends, we need to work at this. We need to be diligent in this. And then there's the area of our mouth. So there's the mind, the heart, and then the mouth. Or the mouth, the, the keyboard, the pen, you know, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. It used to say, well, our mouths represent all those things. How we communicate, what we communicate. The mouth, friends, is a, such a powerful instrument. It, it's biblical you know, the devil knows that it's a, a powerful instrument. Our mouths have the spiritual power for either good and godly or evil and the devil's schemes. The same mouth, James says this, the same mouth can produce blessings and pronounce blessings or it can produce and pronounce cursings. Our words can be a vehicle for the human spirit, the Holy Spirit, or for the evil one in our lives. And so the enemy loves to inspire us and stir up within us, wanting to speak things out, out of order, out of, out of turn, out of place, to speak unbelief, or to speak slander, or to speak gossip, or to speak harsh sarcasm or critical um, speech. And I know that, that many of us as believers in Christ Jesus, many of us carry wounds that have been wounds for years of, of words that were said to us, right? Years ago. Don't let the devil continue to bring those curses into our lives and into your mouth. Think about them. And pray what, what David prayed in Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Set a guard. Set a, sometimes we need to set a muzzle over our mouths, right? To keep watch over the door of my lips is what he says. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So we've talked about this defensive posturing, you know, in this 
spiritual realm of spiritual warfare, warfare that's for every one of us. We're all in the same fight and we need to come against the the onslaught of the enemy. We need to recognize, we need to refuse, we need to resist the 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 primary areas, right? Which is our mind, our our emotions and our attitudes and then our mouths. But then, like I said a few weeks ago, there, there's also a taking back territory, an offensive uh, thrust in our lives that we need to take on as well. I told you a couple weeks ago that when I, when I come early on a Sunday morning and, you know, I've got to set up the sound and got to set up the chairs and what, whatever else, you know, for the Sunday, what am I doing? I'm, I'm doing those things, but I'm... I'm talking with the Lord and I'm praying to the Lord. I'm asking that that for each one that comes, for each one that takes a seat, that they would be filled with all of God's fullness in their lives, that they would have a an opening of their minds and their hearts for the things of the Lord and that Holy Spirit, that he would transform their lives, that he would speak truth into their lives, that he would free some of them that you know, that are that are bound up with hurts or rejections or whatever, and that he would have his place in their lives, that, that our worship would be to an audience of one, to the Lord, not, not for show, not for anything, but it would be for the Lord, and it would be sweet, and that any visitors that come would, would be able to sense that here are a people that, that love each other, here are a people that are determined to worship the Lord, and they're determined to order their lives out of the things that the Lord is speaking into their life through the word of God. You know, these are some of the things that I pray and pray over each time. I'm praying for those that are doing church at home. I'm praying that as you gather, as you come together, whether you're coming together as one or, you know, your family, however that is happening, that it would be true and it would be real and it would be true worship. These are some of the things that I'm praying and I'm praying to the Lord, but I'm also praying against what Satan would have in mind, what Satan would would want to have happen as as we gather in in the name of Jesus, that he wouldn't have a place, that he wouldn't be able to disrupt, that he wouldn't bring disorder. And I and I speak that out, and I speak right, you know, to him and say, "You have no place here." And when I'm, you know, often walking around Chilliwack, walking, you know, um, around our neighborhood, I'm praying. When I'm driving to Rosedale, I'm praying for Rosedale, and I'm coming against, and I'm asking the Lord to show me if there's any things that I need to be praying into or praying against that he's wanting to reveal, you know, spiritual forces that are at work. And that's what... It's so interesting when we think about, you know, things like principalities and powers, like what Paul is talking about. In Daniel 10, back in the Old Testament, there's this angel who had just fought in the heavenly realms, and he was being called the prince of Persia. And then later in the chapter, there's the prince of Greece that is mentioned. And if there's princes of Persia and Greece that were unseen spiritual forces at work that are wanting to thwart the armies of God and the, and, you know, the ones who are the people of God, then we got to, you know, believe that there's, there's princes of Los Angeles and there's princes of Vancouver and there's a prince of Toronto, there's a prince of Chilliwack. Like there's, there's territorial spirits that are ruling uh, they haven't won the, fa- the the battle. They're a defeated foe, but they are trying to keep territory, you know, under the influence of Satan. And it's our job to pre- to pray against those spiritual forces. It's to to come against those. It's interesting. You can you can be in Africa and you can be on a, a territorial border, and you can see on. You know, your sight line on one country where thousands of people are coming to know Jesus every single week. And you can, you know, have your heels back in another country where there's such spiritual darkness. Well, that's because there's spiritual forces at work. And we need to come against in our lives, 
speaking and living the name of Jesus. We need to be gospel light and gospel influence wherever we are. We need to not allow, you know, the devil a foothold in our lives, but we also pray against those spiritual forces and those powers that are at work. And that's what it means to be on the offensive. And so we need to do both in our lives. We need to understand that that God, you know, after the resurrection, Jesus gave and regains, you know, authority to us. And he gives us authority in his name. And that means God has done everything to Satan that, that he wanted to do on the cross, except for punishing him at the very end, right? And so what he does is he commissions us and he calls to us and he raises us up and he gives us spiritual authority. And he says, he basically says, now you people of God, you resist the devil. You in my name, heal the sick. You in my name, you know, cast out the darkness. You in my name, pray for the kingdom to come and for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. You, you do the work as I am working through you. And he's looking for a people. He's on the lookout today in this very generation, friends. He's looking for a people. The people of God who know who they are and who know whose they are and who know their authority and will exercise that authority, right? That we will rise up and we will take our place and that we will be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and that we will put on the full armor of God so we can stand up under the attacks of the enemy and we can bring victory in Jesus' name, taking back ground in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He's looking for a people who will stand in the gap. He's looking for a, a people who will intercede for our nation, who will, you know, intercede and pray, pray, not just be critical, not just, you know, combat, not just come against and, and speak criticism of, of government, but we'll stand in the gap and pray. Pray for our government. Pray against, you know, spiritual forces at work that are wanting to influence government in the wrong ways, right? We're, we're seeing that even now in our world. We're seeing that with, you know, the invasion uh, against Ukraine and that. Like, there are spiritual forces that would love to see that happen, would love to, to see all this happen. And because the devil is wanting to steal, kill and destroy. And so we pray. And we pray for Ukraine, but we pray for Russia as well. We pray for the leadership there. We pray for the the leaders of our nations, right? And we pray that they would, even if they're not believers, that they would have people in their lives and they would have the Spirit drawing them to the things that they need to be about during this time how they need to stand, what they need to do, you know, during this time. We need to pray more than ever for God's will to be done in those places in our lives and for God's will to be done in this place in our lives, right? In our minds, in our hearts, in our attitudes, our emotions, and our words, that our words would be light and our words would be grace notes and our words would be gospel for a world that so desperately needs to hear. God bless you. God bless you. Would you stand firm for him? Baby.
Peace out.